pray together. Father, we thank you this morning. As we come, we are mindful in the days that we live of our great needs, the great needs of this world. We do praise you, Father, for answered prayer, as we prayed last week, for, Lord, the protection of the sanctity of life. And now we pray for the states. We pray for our state. Lord, that you would bring conviction upon man and that they would see all life as precious. And that we were and are created in your image. And life begins at conception. We pray, Father, Lord, for your gospel witness, as we'll speak of this morning, and your word and the church. Lord, I pray for Taylor Creek Church. I pray, Father, for our own hearts, our own, Lord, spirit of conviction and desire for our community, Lord, to minister one another as well, to be a light in this world. For, Lord, there is always great need. And Lord, we want to be beautiful feet. We want to be those who bring the good news. And so this morning I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us, strengthen us, embolden us. Lord, and move us to be the people you desire us to be. I pray for the one who doesn't know you this morning, that the day would be the day of salvation, that they would clearly see that sin separates us from you. And as we have sung, Lord, it's only because of your mercy that is not giving to us what we deserve, but offering what we don't deserve, grace. By the means of the cross of the Son, Jesus, your Son, dying on the cross for our sins, becoming sin on our behalf that we might receive righteousness based on his merits. And so I pray this morning, God, for your spirit to move. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to the letter of Acts once again as we continue our study and the challenge for the church to be the church, church missions, the mission of the church, and this morning we are in Acts 17 as we continue to make our way through our study. In the summer of 1741, something historical happened in the history of Christendom. It happened on a sunny summer July day in Enfield, Connecticut during a midweek service. It was a message given by Jonathan Edwards. Many of you are familiar with it or might be familiar with it. It was the message entitled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Edwards was not scheduled to speak on this day. But the scheduled speaker came down sick, and he urged Edwards to fill the pulpit in his stead. And what took place that day when Edwards preached is described by uh, historians, and one particular doctor, Stephen Nichols, president of Reformed Bible College, and the academic for the Legionnaire Ministries, he writes this, the drama that of the message, overwhelmed the crowd, he says that day. They, they shrieked, and he said they cried as they heard him speak. The drama did not stem, he says, from Edwards' technique. Rather than whoop up the crowd, he says, into a frenzy, Edwards waited for the congregation to regain his composure. And then he pressed on in his sermon. This, the drama, said, came not in, a, in the technique, but in the truth, in the word, the truth of eternal damnation. The truth that all of us, he says, are on the precipice 
Jonathan Edwards preached of eternal judgment, the, the bow of God. He says God's wrath is bent and the arrow is pointed directly at us. We are like spiders dangling over the pit of hell, saved from the flames for the time being as a mere thread or by a mere thread. God used, Nichols says, Edwards to pierce the hearts of men through the word of God. He says Edwards equally matched his imagery of judgment with Im the imagery of redemption of Christ. He says Christ has flung the door of mercy wide open and stands in the door crying and calling with a loud voice to poor sinners. This was the passion of the gospel. This was the, the passion of, of Jonathan Edwards. The evening of revival spread to, to Enfield, Connecticut and exploded outwards. Historians call this the first great awakening. It remains one of the most significant events in United States history. To be clear, the great awakening was not just one man. It was not just John, Jonathan Edwards. Nor did it start on that July day on the 8th of July of 1741. It was already in process through God working, through men preaching the gospel throughout the New England dot colonies. In the days leading up and the days past, much of the revival took place among the young people, those who were in their teens and 20s. There was Bible studies going on, teens coming, asking questions. There was a movement of the Spirit. God had been working. Edwards was speaking in his own hometown, preaching the word in Hampton, Northampton, Massachusetts. Pastors were faithfully preaching the gospel as well. God was also infusing with, with men with the gift of evangelism. George Whitfield came from England and made several trips to the States, preaching the gospel, crowds upward to 10,000 people. The same was happening in England as he preached there. This would be one of several great awakenings that would take place in, the, in, our, in our history. There would be one that would center on Finney, Charles Finney, in the, around 1825, then another around Moody in 1870. One around Billy Sunday, and our most recent around Billy Graham, who many know and know his son, Franklin Graham. Now, as we look at this, we know from Ephesians 4 that, that God has, has gifted some with the gift of evangelism and has and continues to use some with extraordinary gifts in this way to do extraordinary things for the gospel. But when we look at the scriptures, at the center is always ordinary men and women, ordinary people, ordinary believers who yield themselves to Christ, being faithful with the gospel and with their families. As Paul made clear in 1 Corinthians and those who were, who were seeking to follow after men, Paul reminded them, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 and 20 through 29, he says, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, he says, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen the things that are not, so that he might nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast.
What does he mean by this? Paul was meaning that he did not preach the gospel so that he could boast, but because of the one who saved him, because of Christ, because of the great salvation that was given to him. The least of the apostles. It was his love for Christ that, that convicted him of, uh, uh, and gave him compassion for the lost. He does not preach for reward or, or even against his will. He preaches and under, is under compulsion because of the stewardship entrusted to him. And so he says, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. This is my stewardship. This is what God has given me. This is the stewardship of the church. We are to be ambassadors for Christ. This is Paul's words. as an ambassador in chains. Now it is true, again, that Paul had a special calling and gifting, but we know that we too have the calling of God's commission. But not all have great conviction, do we? And we need to be honest with ourselves rather than pretending. We need to be real with ourselves. There are, there are fears to be faced and self-examination that needs to take place in our, in our hearts, in our lives, in our, in our walk. Now, not one of us, I, I think anyway, not one of us do not desire that there would be revival in our cities and our land. But we need to check our hearts because most of us want revival because we want for everything to be at peace. And certainly it's something we pray for. Peter called us to pray for the government. Paul, uh, Paul called us to pray for the government so that, that we would be able to live peaceful lives. But our greatest conviction is to honor the Lord, be convicted over the souls of men, because we're convicted about the gospel and the stewardship given to us. We do need to pray for a revival. But without conviction, we cannot expect our world to be shaken for the gospel. Stephen Nichols, again, who I mentioned earlier, makes this profound point. He says this. You could say awakening comes in two forms. There is the awakening the raising of new life out of death. This is the call to the poor sinners. But even those who have been awakened need awakenings. We slumber in our spiritual laziness, and so we are summoned to wake up. This is the call to the redeemed sinners, and is not by human effort or by natural means. We're awakened only in always by a divine and supernatural light, only by God's grace and always, by, always for God's glory. Now think about that in our own lives. Think about that in our convictions. We need to examine our convictions. We need to examine our, our passion. Paul was wide awake Paul was wide awake. In fact, Paul, you could say it was evidenced, his conviction was evidenced in his custom. And his custom became a pattern of his actions. As he went to them, he went to the synagogue, he went to them and shared the love of Christ. And so this is our takeaway here. Conviction leads to action. If we do not have conviction, if we're not thinking about the Great Commission, there will be no shaking of our world. And if there is no conviction, we need to examine and ask why. And we need to be honest with ourselves. Work through it with the Lord. We need to seek the Lord in it. We need to, to seek one another. We need to ask for prayer. Even Paul asked for prayer, to be bold, to be able to speak how he ought to. And we need to. We need to come together. We need to act like the church. That's why we pray together as a church on Sunday morning. We come together. It feels awkward. It shouldn't feel awkward at all. 
it should feel the, like the most natural thing ever. Because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. That we come together, ask for prayer, we pour our knees together, we, we practice the one another's together. And believe me, the darker the world gets and the more compressed we get together, the more we'll need to pray, to encourage, to uphold, to strengthen, to even support, to even to supply needs for each other. Read Acts 2. So I encourage you to, to think about it. Ask others to pray. Ask others to keep you accountable. Ask others to go with you. For there will be no revival without conviction. Conviction will lead to action, and the action is the gospel. And Paul did not just, just strategically then go to synagogues. He preached the gospel. Notice it says that Luke says that Silas, Paul and Silas reasoned with those in the synagogue from the scriptures concerning the gospel. To turn our world upside down for Christ, we must be competent. And this is what we see here. We need competence in the gospel. And for three Sabbaths, it says they reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. For many, the fear of sharing the gospel is that they do not feel competent. That is, they do not have or feel like they have the ability or the knowledge or the skill to do so. If we're honest with ourselves, these are excuses we are often make for ourselves regardless, even though we are competent. But we must also know, and we do know, that God never calls us to what he has not enabled us to do. Now again, though, there are those who are called with the special gift of evangelism, but remember Paul said to Timothy that we're all called to do the work of evangelist. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. As believers, we need to be competent. We need to be prepared to share the gospel. If we are saved, we know the gospel. We should know the gospel if we're saved by it. And so we should be able to share our simple testimony. But oftentimes we do not because we're fearful. We're fearful of not having the answer that people ask today, that we're not capable of, of fielding a question that, is, that people ask. Well, let me tell you and let me share this one. Sharing the gospel, it's not your responsibility to answer every question that they ask. Because they ask them any questions because they're moving past the very question they need to ask themselves, where they're going to spend eternity. And if you watch any gifted evangelist, they always bring it back. They don't. They set that aside and they deal with the heart first. All of those things will be answered when the first answer, the first issue is answered. But it doesn't give us an excuse not to be prepared, not to be ready. In fact, we are very good at preparing things. We're good at preparing for all kinds of things. We train hard. We have all kinds of different names for them. You know, I, can't even, you know, all the exercise, right? I, I don't know what they mean, some of those names. I know that they all look like they hurt. That's why I don't do any of them. I'm, I'm, for, the, I'm for the machine that you stand on and it just works, right? I don't know if that, you know. So we've seen through history. But that's the way we are sometimes with evangelism. Let somebody else do it. We're so busy about preparing for other things, but we don't prepare for what we're supposed to. In fact, God warns us against it, warns us against immaturity in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 through 12. Paul, or the, or the writer of Hebrews, says he has much to say to them, but he can't. 
He says, it's hard to explain since you have become dull in hearing. He says that, that for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. We know and remember Peter said that we are to sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts. Always being ready to make a defense for the hope that is in us. For those who ask for us to give an account for the hope that's in us. We are to be ready. We're to respond with gentleness and reverence. But we're to be ready. So just as we prepare for other situations, for any other situation in our lives, we are to prepare for the, for the gospel to share it. And this is what Paul did. Paul reasoned from the scriptures. He reasons from the scripture. This word reason is a word that means to, to dialogue. Dialogoma. It means to dialogue or conduct a discussion. That's what the gospel is. It's, it's having a discussion. Some of you are really good at talking. Some of you are, are gifted in the sense you have no problem going to people or, or have no problem just coming and talking to them out of nowhere. But some of us are, are a little more timid. And, and so it is that we have to gird up. But it's what we speak to them, what we dialogue to them about. Paul knows his audience. He's speaking to them, the Jews. He knows, that they're, he knows as well there are God-fearers among them. They're gathered together. They are there at the synagogue. And it's a natural tradition to go and to speak to them, knowing where they're at and where he speaks and what he speaks to them about. We'll talk more about, about next week about speaking to those who've never heard of Christ in verses 16 and following. But regardless, we can talk and we can dialogue, but we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, so we have to share it. And this is what Paul says. He goes in, he speaks to them, and he continues, and he, he explains, and he's giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. The verb here, explain, means to open. It means to open the book in this context. It's the word open. Paul opened the scripture to explain man's need for salvation, to go back to it. What is man's need? Man's need is that he is a sinner. He sinned against God. He faces judgment. It's the gospel. Luke does not share the specific message or passage of scriptures that Paul uses other than what he explained concerning Christ, his promised coming, why he had to suffer, his resurrection. We see the example of this back in Acts chapter 13. Remember there he explained this. He went through several times. We saw it as well in chapter 7 with the first martyr, Stephen. Paul might have used in the same words he used there at Poseidon Antioch. 1 Samuel quoting David in 1 Samuel referring to, to Christ the son of David, the everlasting kingdom. He quoted 1 Samuel 13, 14. He referred to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, referring to the everlasting kingdom, the kingdom, his kingdom that would be everlasting, reaffirming the promise of the Davidic covenant. He shared of his suffering. He certainly may have mentioned Isaiah 52 or 53 about the suffering servant of Christ. He quoted Psalm 1610 of the resurrection, you shall, will not abandon my soul and shield, nor will you allow your Holy One to go under decay. Speaking of the Christ, we see this verse used over and over again throughout Acts. Paul could have shared with them not only the evidence of Scripture, but also could have shared with them evidence of eyewitness, of, as we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 11. Now, we have the benefit of having a New Testament. What is the best way for us to share the gospel with others? How do we do it? How do we, how do we have a conversation? How do we dialogue with them? What verses do we share with them? We're not speaking to Jews. We're speaking to Gentiles. But the gospel is the same. Salvation is the same as the Old and New Testament. One of the easiest ways and the best ways and the easiest ways to walk through the gospel is through the gospels 
and through the book of Romans. I'm just going to share. I'm just going to give you a list of verses here. We call this the Romans Road. It is, I shared my testimony before. Once I got, when I got saved, I memorized each of these verses. Why? Because I wanted to be prepared. I wanted to be able to share the Word of God. I wanted to be able to, to, to share the gospel without having my Bible with me because I don't, carry, I don't carry it around. I certainly don't carry this one around. That's my workout on Sunday morning. I pick it up, bring it to the pulpit, and I set it back down there. You should see my arms. Concerning the gospel, Matthew 5, verses 20 through 28, God's law. It would be important for you to memorize the Ten Commandments. What is the law? What is, what is the Decalogue? What does God require of us? Matthew 5, 20 and 28, Jesus shares of the law. In Matthew 5, verse 20, he shares, For I say to you that unless you, your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Has surpassed them. These are the holy ones. These are the righteous ones. These are, these are, these are the ones we have to, to look up and give us the laws, he says to the Jews. James 2.10 says, Whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at in one point, he has become guilty of all. Jesus reminds us there in John 5, if you, have, if you have hated your brother, it's the same as murder. If you looked on a, a woman in an unworthy manner or a man in the same way for women, you're guilty of adultery. You've broken the command. And I don't care if somebody's never heard of Christ, they understand the law is on their heart. It's written there. They know right from wrong. Man is without excuse, Romans chapter 1, 18 and following. He's without excuse. As I shared many times, the law is the anvil. Have you ever picked up an anvil? You know what an anvil is? It's one of those things that they, they bend iron, they shape iron on. Pick it up, carry it around for a while. That's the law. It weighs, the Holy Spirit convicts. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. God will judge. His wrath is poured out. Romans 3.10. There's no one righteous, not even one. There's not one who does good. There's none who seeks after God. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have. Romans 5, 12, therefore, just as through one man sin into the world, so sin is spread to all men. This is the good part. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrated his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. And we could share and go into 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 3, the gospel. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. That is the gospel. Romans 10, 9 and 10. You hear me quoted it all the time. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. It's the evidence of a transformed heart. It's our dialogue. It's to be prepared to give an answer. Now, there are questions that people are asking. You, you can be an apologist and you can do that, but being an apologist and answering every question is not going to save anyone because it doesn't change the heart. It's the work of the Spirit. It's the Spirit that awakens the heart. 
And this is what Paul did. He reasoned, started a discussion, explained and gave evidence from the scriptures of both man's sin and God's judgment, of Christ and his death for our sins and his resurrection, just as is written. And for the Jews, it would have been significant because they studied the scripture. In fact, as we'll see in a minute, Jesus even affirmed such. Now, Paul did not use fancy words or, or debate with them. He just shared the gospel. He just, he just proclaimed and said, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the Messiah. He is prepared. He was competent with the gospel. He proclaimed that Jesus was the Christ. Now, would you say that you feel competent in your ability to share the gospel? Are you prepared to give an answer for the hope that's in you? Do, you? do you know the scriptures? Have you memorized the scriptures? That's why it's so important, even our, our ministry of our children, that we have them in an adventure club to memorize the scripture, to memorize the gospel, to memorize the doctrines. Even before when we had Awana, I remember my oldest son sitting in a doctor's office quoting scripture to somebody sitting across. We were in a doctor's office a lot as a family. And he was, here's my, I don't know, he's maybe 10, 12 years old. I don't know how old he was, but he was quoting scriptures from Awana. And I was just sitting there grinning, you know, as a father would. Get him, son. If you're not prepared, it's not on the elders, it's not on the pastor, it's on, it's on each of us. It's on each of us. It begins with a conviction in the heart of our love for the Lord and for lost souls as stewards and ambassadors of Christ. And it then leads to seeking to be competent, to sanctifying Christ as Lord in our lives, as Lord, and, and being prepared to give an answer for the hope that's in us. Neither as well as it just a stewardship of the old. It is the stewardship of all believers, young and old. Young people, let me ask you, do you think about your call to shake the world for Christ? Do you think about God is wanting you to share the gospel? He's wanting you to impact your world around you, to impact your peers because they're impacting you. They want to impact you. Do you have the message of hope? We can take this example as well from Jonathan Edwards. On May 10th, 1716, Jonathan Edwards wrote a letter to one of his ten sisters. Think about that. He wrote a letter to his, his sister Mary when he was 12. This was his letter, an excerpt from it. I don't know if you can see it through all the jungle. He says, Dear Mary, through the wonderful mercy of goodness of God, there have in this place been a very remarkable story of the pouring out of the Spirit of God. It's a 12-year-old. And likewise now is, but I think I have reason to think it is in some measure diminished, but I hope not much. About 13 have joined the church in a state of full communion. I think there comes commonly Mondays about 30 persons to speak with Father about the condition of their souls. He's a, he's a PK. Grandfather's a, as well. His wife's father was a pastor as well. So you're thinking, boy, he should be, shouldn't he? No. 12 years old. He was talking at 12 years old about the awakening, referring to souls coming to Christ. At 12 years old, his mind was about souls. May each of us be in thought about our conviction and where it should lead and us in our thought and actions, both young and old. And young people, I encourage you at youth group, don't don't get in your holy huddles. It's okay to be there, to have fellowship, to, to, to cultivate your, your time together, but, but look around. Is there a student standing there by themselves? Do they, 
Are they not with people? I say it to you because I say it to the adults as well. When I look up on Sunday morning, I see somebody new with us, and they're standing all by themselves, and everyone gathers to their corners. We need to fellowship. We need to, to see that the opportunities we have as a church. This is what we see as we look here. I want us to think about being prepared in the same way we prepare for everything we love to do. We must think first of the kingdom of God, which will be, then be reflected in the kingdom of earth. It is only then when we'll turn the world upside down for Christ. And this is what we see in the rest of our passage as such. We notice again that not only in the ability of men, but in the power of the gospel, as we see throughout the book of Acts, this is a gospel that turns the world upside down, and the world only awake, is awakened by the word of Christ and the work of the Spirit. And so this is what we see. Not only did Paul have the, the conviction, but he had the confidence, but he also had the confidence in the gospel. Look at it. Some of them were persuaded to join Paul and Silas along with a large number of God-fearing Greeks and a number of leading women. Now these were more noble minded those in Athens, or the, those in uh, Berea, he says in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examined the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed among them a number of prominent Greek women and men. Luke says in Thessalonica, some of the Jews were persuaded to believe. Who persuaded him? The Holy Spirit persuaded him. Paul was just there with a word. A large number came to Christ, a large number of, of, of God-fearers. Those who were those who were Greeks who were coming, who were seeking the one true God. God was drawing their hearts just like Lydia. They were eager to hear the word in Berea. They were noble in this way, and certainly we, we should be noble about scriptures. This is talking about the Jews in Berea compared to the Jews in Thessalonica. The Jews in Thessalonica uh, were not so noble in that sense. The Jews in Berea were, in fact, they were noble about the Scriptures. All of them would, would, would say they were. Jesus says, you search the Scriptures. And you think that, you, that in them you have eternal life. It, it is these that testify about me, and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. This is those in Thessalonica. The Bereans were searching. God was open in their heart. They were eager to receive the word. The Jews in Thessalonica were unwilling to listen. Their eyes were closed. Their hearts were hard. God was doing a work, though. And this is what we need to notice here, that God is the one who prepares heart. That God is the one who saves. God is the one who, who has since the beginning. He is called. He's the one who saves. He's the one who opens the eyes. We see in Acts chapter 13, 48, Paul says, As many as were called believed. In Acts 16, verse 14, God says he opened Lydia's eyes or opened her heart to believe. And so it is, this is what we see here in 1 Thessalonians. In fact, the God-fearers were desirous to hear. They, they, they looked forward. In fact, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, 4 through 5 says, Knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in the power of the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you. For your sake. He says too, he prays them, he says, when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. The point here is we're the messengers. It's not, it's not that you have to say, not that you're going to mess it up, as we've repeated over and over again. This is the pattern of Acts. God is the one who persuades. We are the one who brings the message and preaches the message. He is the one who brings the good news. We are the feet, as Romans 10 says. And this leads us to a last point here, turning the word, turning our world upside down. Would The world will act out negatively, as we've seen. We already studied this mostly in our previous studies. The world will bring conflict. Jesus said you will have conflict in the world. 
And here we see the continued world of opposition from the depraved and the, and the despotic. They are the world who are, who are blinded by Satan. We see in Thessalonica the Jews pro becoming jealous. They took along men, again, just like they did in Philippi. They took some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob in the city, brought it up into uproar, and attacked the house of Jason. Take it kind of personal. They were seeking to bring them out, of the, out to the people. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some of the brethren before the city authorities, shouting, these men have upset the world. They've turned our world upside down. And have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king. What he means by this is they are calling to worship another. Caesar was looked at as a god. They were contemplating, it was against the law, ultimately defining the law that to, to speak against Caesar as, another, as someone to worship another king. And so they were saying and making an acclamation uh, that they were worshiping another king other than Caesar. And so they stirred up the city authorities and heard these things. And when they had received a pledge from Jason, that is a promise, maybe financial as well, from others, they, re they released them. But he received a pledge from them that they would not continue to house them, ultimately for the sake of the brethren. They went on to Berea, but these Jews from Thessalonica found them and they did the same thing. They came there as well, the agitating and stirring up the crowds. And immediately the brethren sent Paul out as far as the sea. And Silas and Timothy remained there. And so they, they escorted Paul as far as Athens. As we already noted in our previous messages, Jesus is very clear. If the world hates you, it, it hated me first. Paul knew that there would be conflict. In fact, later he, we read, and the Holy Spirit told him in Acts 20 that he had have conflict in every city. What was his response then? Notice what he responds as. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly the gospel of the grace of God. He didn't account his life for more important than the gospel, more important than Christ. Now the conflict that that Paul and Silas experience will not be what most of us will experience in our lifetime, yet regardless of the veracity of the response, if any at all, we are to take courage in Christ. We are to be, take courage. We see the pattern over and over again. Paul, regardless of being dragged out, being beat, being, being, uh, being, being imprisoned, they went back into the city. We saw this in the beside Antioch. He was beaten. He's dragged out. And he walks back into those cities there after being left for dead. These men were courageous for the gospel because it was, it, their, life was, their life was in Christ. And they loved Christ more than their lives. We see it with missionary, the testimonies of missionaries over and over again. We spoke many weeks about, ago about the Elliots, Jim, Elliot, and those who were with him with the Aki Indians, their, their life was Christ. And it's hard for us as believers because we are so focused and, and to come to the realization that, that this life is just this. And remember Paul said to the Philippians, if for me to die is gain, right? To me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And it's hard for us to think about that. He says, my citizenship is in heaven. I long to be with Christ, but if it's meant for me to stay here and minister, so I will do so, but how much more for me to be a part and be with Christ? I know we're getting squirmy now. It makes us all think about what's most important to us. 
We are to be courageous. Jesus promised this. It says we are to be courageous. It says, listen, in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. But take courage. I have overcome the world. I have overcome it. Don't be afraid. This goes clear back to even David. I love the words of Psalm 27. O oh Lord, my light and my salvation, whom will shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread when evildoers came upon me do, to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies? They stumbled and fell. The host of camp are against me. My heart will not fear. The war rise against me. In spite of this, I shall, not, I shall be confident. I shall be confident. And it goes on in verse 24 or 4. It says, One thing I have asked from the Lord that I, I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. He knew to be absent from the body was to be present with the Lord. How do we shake the world for Christ? How do we turn the world upside down for Christ? It is conviction. It is competence. It is confidence. It's courage. It's courage. I hope that each one of us this week just thinks about these. Do I have conviction? What are your convictions? Do I have competence with the gospel? Begin to memorize the scripture. Practice it. Get your parents saved, young people. Vice versa. Practice it. Be diligent. Be tactful. Have a plan. Have a plan. I encourage you, get online. Watch Ray Comfort and his many examples. Have confidence that just sharing the Word of God leave a tract be, have courage. What did the believers do at Thessalonica? Did they change their world? You betcha they changed their world. I love this passage. It says here, you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation, with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. That is the area of Greece. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything from you. This letter was written not long after his time in Thessalonica. There was an awakening in Thessalonica. There was an awakening. God has called us. Young people, it's time to rise up. It's time to stop thinking about all the things in the world and all the, all the stuff. It's okay to have it, but don't make it your idol. It's time to rise up and stand up and to think about how you're going to reach, how you're going to be the generation. Speak the truth. Stand for the truth. Start a Bible study. Start a prayer group. Do something. The same for us as adults. It's time to rise up. It's time to pray with each other. It's time to be real about our faith. Or more real about our faith. I don't know your hearts. I know where I'm at. I know what I need to do. I know that this message is actually just me. I just happen to be looking at you. Believe me, it's making me shake even thinking about all these things. Father, please help us. Undergird us. Lord, give us conviction, competence, and confidence, and courage. Lord, we are in great need of you. Father, it is trepidatious in our world. 
But as you said, take courage, for I have overcome the world. In this world, Lord, we will have tribulation. But we are not of this world. Lord, help us, Lord, to get that in our mind this week. Help us to see it. Help us to live it. Help us to breathe it. Help us to be, Lord, faithful to go about it. And may it begin here at VBS. I pray for all the children that will be coming this week. I pray for the gospel. I pray for their hearts. I pray for your spirit to bring, Lord, open hearts and salvation. I pray for our week as we have those we're praying about, those who are on our prayer list, that we continue to pray for them, seek opportunities. I pray for courage to speak the word in truth. Lord, may we turn our world upside down. Lord, we do pray for revival for our land. We pray for an awakening. We pray, Father, that, God, you would raise up special men and to preach to the herald evangelism, to, ha to herald the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and let's sing together. Let's lift our hearts up together to the Lord and ask him for all these things.